All right, now we're going to talk about how the Bible identifies mental illness. How God, who God thinks is mentally ill and who God thinks is mentally well. And we're also going to look at the people that are truly, meant, that have feeble-minded, that they are feeble-minded according to Scripture. People like with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease or Down syndrome. We're going to look at what the Bible says about them and how, you know, what our responsibility is with them as Christians, Bible-believing Christians. So, let's look here. We're going to see how God kicks modern, quote-unquote, science. If you saw the first part of the study, uh, you know that 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, condemns oppositions of science falsely so-called. So, let's go first to Colossians chapter 2. We have here, um, one, two, three, four... Five different categories of people that the Bible classifies as mentally ill. People that are that have lost it up here. First, you have philosophers. Let's look about this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Did you know that you can be spoiled through somebody teaching you philosophy? Hmm. Well, if you can be spoiled through somebody teaching you philosophy, then what does God think of the philosopher who taught you? They're rotten. They're crazy. You know, spoiled, it's kind of like something that's rotted. A bunch of things out there, you know, fruits and nuts that are rotten. You know, you are what you eat, you know. little joke there. But the point is, God looks at philosophers and he says, you listen to those foolish philosophers, they will spoil you. They'll ruin you. <clears throat> Turn next to 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> Why would they mess with your head? Why do, you know, what's wrong with these philosophers? Well, there's a reason for them. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 3 through 8 says here, not given to... Okay, I'm sorry. No, it's uh, 6, chapter 6. I was in chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 8. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, in other words, the man does not believe the Bible, if you want to get right down to it. Look at verse 4. Here's what God thinks of him. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Interesting there, because modern day psychiatry, you sit down, they ask you all kinds of questions. When did this happen? When did that happen? How soon, how, when did, you know, how long ago did such and such? Tell us about your childhood. What was your father like? What was your mother like? Was it? Question, 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 question. Just like it says here. <clears throat> Look at verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Interesting. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Sigmund Freud was a sex pervert. That's the majority of what his work was centered around. He came up with all kinds of stuff, all kinds of sex perversion type of stuff. He was definitely a pervert. <clears throat> verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Hmm. Some interesting things there. Now let's look at the next group. So you see philosophers, the psychiatry thing. If you saw the first part of the study, you know that psychiatrists are sick mentally. Okay, they are two to three more times likely to commit suicide. 73% uh, of the female psychiatrists have major depression problems. So, you know, these people are sick mentally, just like the Bible says. The Bible confirms, you know, modern science. Interesting. Now let's look at the next group that God says are mentally ill. Go back in your Bible to Psalm 14. Psalm 14, verse 1 through three. It says here, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. 
The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You say, what's the second group? Atheists. Yeah. Atheists are mentally ill. Now, you know, they are mentally ill if they're true atheists, but uh, the Bible says here, they say in their heart, there is no God. In other words, it's something that they believe, they feel. It's not something intellectual necessarily. It's more of a feeling because they don't like to be judged for their sins. And that's the, the whole problem with atheism. I don't believe that there are any real, true atheists out there that can look at this world and say, it came about by random chance, billions of years ago. You truly really have to be crazy to believe that. Go next to Psalm 53. Psalm 53, verses 1 through 3. We're going to see the similar thing here again. Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. Corrupt are they, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So again, you see the same thing there, what God thinks of people that don't believe in him. God is not saying, oh, I respect you. You know, I've gotten these foolish atheists, and they'll come along to the channel, and they'll be like, you know, I'll, I'll say such and such to them, and they go, I'm an atheist. Just like I'm supposed to go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. I'll, I'll respect you because I respect your, your religious tradition there or something, or I respect you as a scientist. I don't have any respect for you if you're an atheist. You're a fool, okay? That's the whole thing. I mean, if you can sit there and look at your computer or your little iPhone or something like this, and you can see, uh, you know, and pushing the thing and t clicking on things like that, and yet you can look at a leaf out there in nature, the leaf is something that grows every year. It can transform sunlight into chlorophyll. I mean, the thing is, it's an amazing invention of God, and that thing came about as a random chance, but your iPhone was created. You're crazy. You're out of your mind. You know? And the leaf comes from a single ancestor, too. So you get an oak tree, a maple tree, a beech tree, a birch tree, a, a whatever, all these different trees, and they all trace back to one common ancestor, which came from a puddle of goo. And then you take man, you take a people, mankind, and we all came from, from goo, mistakenly. Or maybe it was a you know, space aliens that planted us here. You're crazy. You're a fool. You're mentally ill if you truly believe that. I have no respect for atheists. None. None at all. They say, well, religion is filled with hypocrites. You turn your Bible to Romans chapter 1. Religion is filled with hypocrites. Yeah, that's why we're against it. You know, most of us are against organized religion. Bible-believing Christians. I mean, get a, get a Bible out and read it sometime and you'll see that a lot of what falls under organized religion has no basis in scripture but that's right atheists are fools they have no delay in understanding but that their heart may discover itself the bible talks about you know they don't want to understand things they don't want to understand the universe they don't want to seek after god for the same reason a thief doesn't want to look for a police officer they know they've done wrong and see if you go come and you find god you understand that there is a God in that huge universe, of, you know, the expansive universe that's out there, and you, you say, I don't believe that there is a God. Okay, you understand 100% of what is out there? Couldn't God exist in the amount of that universe that you don't understand? I mean, it'd be like me saying, I don't believe that there is one pink Lazy Boy recliner in the entire state of Maine. I can believe that, but I can't prove that unless I've been to every single home in the entire state of Maine. You see? I can't make an, a, a statement like that, that there are no, there is no such thing as a pink lazy boy recliner in the entire state of Maine. I can't say that statement. And how much more foolish it would be for me to make a statement that there is no God in the entire universe. God does not exist. You're a fool to make a statement like that. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 25. Another good explanation of atheism. It says here, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's where I come in at, okay? That's where Christians come in at. But if you're an atheist, here's where you come in at. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's why you want to be an atheist. You don't want to be judged for your sin. You want to look at pornography without any kind of guilt. You want to be a sodomite without any kind of guilt. You want to watch Hollywood movies or whatever else, drink, fornicate, do drugs, whatever else, and you don't want to be judged for it. That's the whole thing with atheists. That's why you're mentally ill. That's why you're mentally sick. And all those things, by the way, are self-destructive too. Okay? All of them are going to destroy you. Continuing, verse 19, Because that which uh, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You say, how's that? Verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know what you need to do if you're an atheist? An atheistic fool? You need to get away from the stupid computer, go outside in nature, go on a camping trip. And just go study nature. Get a couple field guides or something like that and just go see how many bugs you can identify or how many trees you can identify or rocks or minerals, whatever. Go out there and study nature a little bit. And then ask yourself the question, did it all come about by random chance billions of years ago? Or is there a creator God there who created it? That's what you need to do. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You get it? You see how scripture ties together? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, atheists, mental illness. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's what you will be, your final state, if you're an atheist, and you just reject God and reject God and reject God. God will give you over to a rubber bait mine. So you truly will go through this world seeing the magnificence of nature, the magnificence of how God created you. And the Bible says, by him all things consist. By Jesus Christ, all things consist. You are plugged in. Your life comes from God himself. And God can pull the plug anytime and you drop dead. But you can get so mentally ill, so mentally sick, that you can walk through this world just completely disconnected from, I don't believe in God. I don't believe that there is a God. I believe that you know, science has proved that there is no God. And uh, You can go through life like that and die and go to hell and burn forever. You know why? You say, well, why would a loving God do a thing like that? A loving God provided you a way out. You didn't have to go to hell. Hell's created for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25 talks about that. You don't have to go to hell. You weren't created for hell. You were created to go to heaven when you die. And Jesus Christ paid the price. You don't even have to do anything. All you got to do, come to God and say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I trust that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I trust that that's enough to pay for my sins. Boom, eternal life. God will reveal truth to you. This book that you once thought contradicted itself, all of a sudden is going to make sense and you'll see what the contradictions are all about. You'll see that there are dispensational changes, things that happen in the Old Testament that are different in the New Testament. You'll see those changes. And then you'll see these supposed contradictions in the Bible. They're not really contradictions at all. You know, there are whole books on that. I got a whole book back there, over 500 of these supposed contradictions. The errors in the King James Bible, they're all explained. They're not contradictions. But you see, when you're looking for contradictions, when you're looking to disprove God, God will give you over to a reprobate mind. God will let you go with something like modern-day psychiatry so that you can think that people like us are sick and that you are mentally well. And why will God do that? He'll give you what you want. I don't think it's right. I think that I should have a free choice. You do have a free choice. You have a free choice to accept or to reject Jesus Christ. And if you reject Jesus Christ, 
then you pay the consequences. If you accept Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ pays the consequences and you get in to heaven. His righteousness is imputed to you. It's given to you. Next, let's go to Romans chapter 3. You say, well, atheism is growing and Christianity is dying. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. You can judge me all you want. Okay? Myself and the other Bible-believing Christians out there, we overcome. We're going to overcome all you stupid, foolish atheists out there that think that you know things and, you know, all you ignorant little Christians. Oh, we're going to see who's ignorant. We're going to see who's foolish. You know, as Bible prophecy is being fulfilled, Israel's been reborn as a nation. There's worldwide satellite television as prophesied in Revelation chapter 11. The two witnesses die and the whole world sees them at the same time within three days. Now, see, that wasn't possible before satellite television. How could a book that's written in 1611 know about satellite television? And it goes on and on and on. The whole world is going to be controlled by a cashless system, a mark that's taken in the right hand or in the forehead. Implantable microchips, RFID technology. 400-year-old book telling you what's going to happen in the future, and here we are. It's happening. Oh, but that's okay. It's just crazy nonsense, just religious silliness. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, reprobate mind. Keep telling that. You're mentally ill. How about worldly career-driven people? See, so you have professing atheists. You turn your Bible to Luke chapter 12. You have professing atheists, people that say, well, you know, I don't believe there's science for, you know, the proof of God and whatever else. You have people that profess to be atheists. They come around, I'm an atheist. I refuse to believe in God. I hate God. I, I destroy, you know, I hate Christmas and I hate anything to do with God. And we're going to kick out the Ten Commandments and kick out nativity scenes. And we're going to kick out anything to do with Jesus Christ. I mean, if you don't believe in something, if, if, it's, if it's just a bunch of kooky nonsense, why are you going around like a, some kind of a, a religious zealot fighting against it? What a bunch of fools. But you have practice, you have professing atheists, and then you have practicing atheists, people that live without reference to God. And that's what you get with people that are worldly and career driven. Let's look at that. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. Luke, Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Why not give it to the poor? Well, no, I can't do that. Verse 18, And he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, have your 401k retirement system and your pension coming and your and your wise sound investments and you've done all this great work and you're going to have a good retirement and you're going to you know have already have my funeral plot picked out and and I already have my place you know at the retirement home where the assisted care can come and you know take care of me and all this uh-huh you got it all planned out do you Let's see what happens verse 20 but god had said unto him thou fool Wait a second, I thought it was the fool that said in his heart there is no God. Yeah. See, the atheist is the professing fool. But the career-driven person is the practicing fool. I mean, how crazy are you to go and you have a job and you get all your stuff done and you're, you're I'm saving up for my future, but I'm not saved. I don't want to get to know God. I don't want to think about eternity. But I do want to think about retirement. What, are you crazy or something? Are you mentally ill? Well, sure, that's what those people are. It's absolutely what they are. Verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Worldly career-driven people 
are insane. Mark chapter 8. Turn over to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. And when he had called the people unto him with the disciples, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Like the guy over there, the rich man. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And yet they do all the time. They do all the time. The vast majority of people out there trying to gain the whole world. You ask the average lost person, what is your, if you could have 10 wishes, you know what it'll be? It'll be to gain the whole world. I want to have lots of money. I want to have fame. I want to have a really good looking wife or, or something like that. You know, all this stuff, worldly, 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 worldly. And they're losing their own soul. How foolish. Verse 37, Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever there sh therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Hmm. That's why people don't want to get saved. You say, why? They're ashamed of God's words. They don't want to be called a religious bigot, some kind of zealot, Bible thumper crazy fundamental fanatic mm -hmm. right there they're ashamed of Jesus Christ and of his words interesting you say well uh, you know but the, the whole thing is you know that you, you've never experienced you know nobody's ever experienced what it's like to really be famous and I mean it's really worth it and everything else let's see about that too turn back in your Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 you see the Bible gives you the answers that you need. And there was a man that uh, lived that was more powerful, more wealthy, had more women um, than anybody else that's ever lived. You say, who's that? King Solomon. If you want to see his wisdom, read the book of Proverbs. He was a very, very wise man, the wisest man that ever lived outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was very wealthy. I mean, the guy's dealing into the billions of dollars in physical gold every year 666 talents of gold in one year you know i mean interesting number too by the way but uh i have a study on that i think the world's greatest celebrity or something i think it's called you can hear that whole study i have all the you know math worked out and everything else for you know figuring up how much he actually made physical gold wise you know just crazy amounts of gold and silver was even just kind of like a scrap metal to him you know I mean, amazing. I mean, and you get these guys today, all these rich billionaires, multi-billionaires. It's numbers on a computer. They don't have access to the physical gold. They might have some in their vaults or whatever else, but they can't, they can't lay all their money out in front of you and say, there, that's my wealth. They can't do that. It's numbers on a computer. It's paper money. It's, it's toilet paper, <laughs> fiat currencies. They're not as rich as King Solomon. King Solomon had a thousand women that he could choose from. What was it? 700 wives, 300 concubines, something like that. Not one night stands, not a bunch of prostitutes that he meets out there on a street corner. 1,000 women that he could choose from whenever he wanted. And what's he say? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Let's read these. It says, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments, and that of all sorts. Okay, just stop there for just a minute. 
Physical wealth. He had physical wealth, great physical wealth. The wealthiest man ever that ever lived on this planet. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all they, all, all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on all the labor that I labored to do, and behold, it was great and wonderful, and I was very happy and peaceful. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't say that. It says, All was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. There's that word fool again. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. You know you're going to discover that if you have any kind of intellect in this life. If you have any kind of a brain that you haven't destroyed through chemicals and through entertainment and whatever else. If you haven't destroyed your mind yet, you are going to come to that point. You say, well, I don't believe it. How about Ernest Hemingway? The great author, Ernest Hemingway, you know, there. And, and he does all this stuff and everything else. How's it end? He's a sect pervert. Ends up, takes a shotgun, blows his brains out. One of the greatest minds of all time, splattered all over the walls. <laughs> Why? Had no reason to live. He had everything. He went through, he wasn't even close to King Solomon's level of, of success, but he had all kinds of things. Why do you think these celebrities kill themselves all the time? There's nothing in this world that is worth you giving up your soul. And what you'll discover is you'll go out and you'll try to find happiness in things. I tried it. I tried fast cars, motorcycles, uh, trucks, you know, all kinds of things. Just spending my money trying to, to one thrill to the next thrill and uh, going really, really fast on motorcycles and all kinds of extreme crazy things that I did in my youth. You know what? It didn't satisfy me. It didn't make me happy. And I did this all as a professing Christian, by the way, too. Okay? And uh, while I was a professing Christian, there were times I wished that God didn't exist. Because I was sinning, I was living in sin, and I didn't want God judging me for that sin. You see? I was running away from God while going to church. Yeah, sure. Sure. It's really something, isn't it? But some of you haven't figured it out yet, and you probably will never figure it out. You'll just go from one thrill to the next. You'll ju just go and, and, you know, well, if I can just get this. If I could just see that new movie that came out, if I could just get that new computer, if I could just get that new iPhone that they just came out with, and if I could get that new that new Apple Watch, and if I could get this new thing, and if I could just if I could just get that thing, I'd be happy. And you get the thing, and you're not happy. Then you have an, another goal to go to, and you go to there, and you go to there, and you go to there. And you know what you'll discover at the end of your life? Many times those people discover what was the point of it all. And the more success you get in this world, the more unhappy you'll be. Just like our article over here talked about psychiatrists. Head of your field in the medical establishment and everything else. Sick mind Freud. Sick mind Freud. Great. The father of psychiatry. And he's going to the doctor at the end of his life. Kill me, please. I'm in too much pain. Kill me. I don't want to live anymore. Just kill me, please. Inject me with morphine here. Kill me, kill me, kill me. It's a shame he didn't get saved. It's a shame he spent his whole life trying to explain away sin and judgment. How about that? 
What's the next type of uh, mental illness according to Scripture? How about the perpetual optimist? Hey, the mark of the beast technology is here. Look at the things are getting really bad. I don't think so. I think it's, you know, some people might not agree with some of the technology, but I think things are getting better. You know, uh, hey, boy, they never did clean up that spill out there in the Gulf, you know, and there's still oil coming in. And th Oh, I don't think so. I think that things are going to be okay. Hey, Fukushima is still dumping nuclear radiation into the ocean. It's basically a toxic waste dump out there. There's so much plastic in the Pacific Ocean now. There are a whole, like, you know, mats of plastic out there in the Pacific Ocean floating around. That means the whole ocean is just destroyed. The, the you know, environment is falling apart. It's, it's being destroyed. The geoengineering and things like this, killing trees all over the place. Oh, I don't think so. I think things are better. The economy is falling apart. We're, how many trillions of dollars in debt now? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what are they? They're mentally ill. Let's look about that. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 9. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Why are they scoffers? Walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. <laughs> you know, the Bible said, Jesus said that there would be earthquakes in diverse places. The, the massive increase in earthquakes is undeniable. I mean, it's scientifically proven that earthquakes are just going through the roof. And what do you have? You have people going, well, I don't think it's really that bad. I mean, it's just that, you know, we have more earthquakes today, not, not because of more. It's just we have more instruments that can read earthquakes and they didn't have the instruments in the past and they couldn't tell. And, you know, what are you? Perpetual optimist. They're willingly ignorant. They're saying, oh, you know, where's the promise of Jesus coming? And I don't really see this thing of Jesus is coming back. I mean, I don't really see it there. I mean, this prophecy stuff in the Bible, it's it's just coincidence and whatever else that this stuff's going on. And, and there's wars and rumors of wars and there's rioting and looting and, and disease and pestilence and everything. Well, it's always been that way. 20th century, more blood was shed as a result of war and, and genocide and whatever else. More blood was shed in 100 years, the 20th century, than in the entire recorded history of mankind before that. Things are looking up, <laughs> you know? What, 200 million people killed in the 20th century? Two world wars never happened before. Two world wars third one on the way coming soon you know oh but i i don't know i, I think things are you know i think we're gonna have peace on earth soon we got the united nations now yes in the united nations oh you mean the united nations that sponsored over 145 wars since its inception back in the 1940s oh you mean that united nations the ones that sends out their uh, peace keeping troops and they go out and they kill people that that united nations that's going to bring in world peace Sure, you're crazy. Cuckoo. Let's continue. Verse 4, And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. We did read that one already. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that, that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now be, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved un, uh, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." Oh, God's such a mean, horrible, harsh, mean guy and things like this because he sends people to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long-suffering. He's given you clear prophecies. He's shown you there are things, things out there in the natural world. The Grand Canyon shows that there was a, a huge flood at some point in time in the past. The flood in the days of Noah. The fossil record. The entire fossil record. How do you get fossils? Okay? Animal just falls down and dies and just fossilizes right there on top of the ground. 
I don't think so. It's rapid burial. And the minerals get in there and things like that, and it fossilizes the dead body. Evidence of a flood, a global flood in the days of Noah. Proof that the Bible is true. God gives you so many proofs, so many things right in front of your face. He's not willing that any should perish. He provides you with salvation. It's a free gift. It doesn't cost you a thing. And yet people still, I just don't see it. I, I don't really think that the earth is getting worse. I, I just think that, you know, I mean, I have my job and, and my friends and my family. And we're going to have our house paid off soon. And, and I like that new car that they came out with. I'm thinking I might eventually get in debt and buy that thing. And, and I think that, you know, I think America's, you know, coming back. And, and you know, what was it? 2009 was the summer of recovery. You know, <laughs> you're insane. You're mentally ill. And that goes for other people too. I mean, Americans, I think right now Americans are in the lead for mental illness, you know, but I know that there are other people in other countries that are just as, as sick and mentally ill as well. Let's look at the last group, Romans chapter one, the reprobate minded Romans chapter one verses 26 through 32 says here, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient." We're going to read about those reprobate mind characteristics here in just a minute. But how interesting. Right there you have this thing of sodomy. And it's so crystal clear. I mean, give me a break. Oh, well, I don't really know if it refers to gay people. Of course it does. You know? And it's not saying, hey, you're a, a sodomite. We should take you into the public thing here, you know, and kill you and murder you and stuff like that. No, 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 no. What was going on in the Old Testament was God was building a political kingdom. That's why the, the nation of Israel had armies. They were going out and they were fighting and things like this. It was about land. It was about real estate. Okay. That kingdom program got put off for a while. And when it comes back, it's Jesus Christ himself that comes down and takes over. He comes down and fights with his armies from heaven. And if you're a Christian, you're going to be part of that army. right? That's what's going on there. So things change. Right now, a sodomite can get saved. Now, I don't believe that they can continue in sodomy. I don't, you know, not at all. You have to get away from that sin. It's very grievous, very wicked, very, very horrible in God's sight. One of the main reasons why is because you're sterilizing yourself. I mean, does God, did God create men and women to just be sodomites within their own circles? You do that for a couple generations. If everybody was a sodomite, mankind would cease to exist. Why would God do a thing like that? That wasn't God's plan. Sodomy is an, is an abomination. It is an aberration. It's not what God designed. All right? It doesn't mean that I'm hateful for telling you that. It just means what the Bible is plainly teaching here. And I don't teach that sodomites today have to be put to death. Was the death penalty there for them in the Old Testament? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But see, if I tried to teach that for today, I'd have to go on and condemn the people in these next couple verses also to be put to death. Let's look about this. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, kind of like the replacement theology people, Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, now look at this, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. If you're watching this stuff as entertainment in television or Hollywood movies, you know, you're in trouble with the Lord. Okay, it's a bad thing. But the point is, there, you're worthy of death. 
Definitely. And when you understand that, I am worthy of death. I should be killed. I should go to hell for what I'm doing. Then, you know, and you can come to that realization, uh, you know, through the schoolmaster the Bible talks about, which is the Ten Commandments, the law of God which is perfect, and it convicts you of sin, and it convicts you and, you, and you look at this list here and you say, wow, the Bible has prophecies, the prophecies are coming true. The Bible condemns certain things as sin that's not, you know, psychiatry, oh, it's just a mental disorder. No, it's sin. It's sin. And when you get convicted of that, then you say, I need to come to God as that sinner. I need to look at reality and not be mentally ill anymore, not, not have true mental sickness and say that that God's standards aren't real and the Word of God is not real and whatever. You get real and you say, God exists. He has standards. He judges sin. I need to get saved. I'm worthy of death. Okay? And I don't want to die. I don't want to go to hell. And you come to God as a sinner in a repentant state. You say, I'm, I, I can't save myself. I, I have to rely totally on what Jesus Christ did to pay for my sins. I can't work my way in and be good enough. And God will save you. That's how the thing works. You say, well, uh, most people don't do that. Yeah, that's proof that most people are mentally ill. Truly mentally ill. Not according to psychiatry. Okay? And ironically, too, though, I mean, the people that are out there, everybody out there is going to qualify for some kind of mental illness within the field of psychiatry. Guarantee it. But what about those people who are truly feeble-minded, according to what the Bible says? Let's look about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Because, you know, the body of Christ, buddy, we, you know, when, when it's all about, you know, those of us that are really, that have it mentally together, you know, and everything. I mean, we're just we put down the other people and, and if you're not intellectual, there's no place for you in the church. You know. Is that what the Bible teaches? Not at all. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty two through twenty six says here, Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there, be, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now I realize that that's talking about somebody that's not very honorable or whatever else. doesn't have to mean somebody who's feeble-minded. But... If it's true for somebody who spiritually is down, a novice, or somebody just got saved, whatever, how much more true is it for somebody that is actually feebly minded? Somebody, an older person that has Alzheimer's or some young person that has Down syndrome, you know, what should we be doing as Christians? We should be lifting them up and, and supporting the weak, helping them. What we should be doing. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says here, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Are there feeble-minded people out there? Yes, there are. There really are. There are people that, through genetic problems or whatever, or health problems. I know um, if you work a lot with uh, heavy metals, not necessarily the music, but that's implicated too, you know, somewhat. Uh, but heavy metals, aluminum, mercury, things like that, and that stuff gets into your brain, it'll start to fry brain cells and things, and next thing you know, you're going to be coming down with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or some of the other things. I don't know so much about Parkinson's, but Alzheimer's definitely, you know, if you get heavy metals into your into your brain, it will fry certain parts of your brain. And you have older people that are really coming down with a lot of Alzheimer's right now. I mean, again, the rate of Alzheimer's is constantly going up. And why? Well, because our, our atmosphere is so toxic now. We have, you know, geoengineering that's, that's putting aluminum particles into the atmosphere. You have 
uh, a lot of aluminum cookware, a lot of uh, other chemicals and things within food. I mean, I actually, I saw the one time um, years and years ago um, that uh, my mother, I was there the one time and she, she uh, as like a family get together and she had bought this cake. It was like an angel food cake or something and it was like strawberry angel food cake and it tasted kind of funny. It was just like something, something kind of weird here. I mean, should have been a clue. The thing was like red, you know, food, you know, with a lot of food coloring in it. Food coloring is real bad for you, but you know, and it looked at the ingredients. It had aluminum in it. I mean, it said aluminum as one of the ingredients to this cake. Uh, yeah, that's real good for you. You know, that's something that you should be eating aluminum. You know, but I remember I used to work at the at this one factory and we would cut aluminum and things. We'd fabricate things out of aluminum and there was all these warnings on it, you know, warning aluminum, inhaling aluminum smoke and things, uh, you know, can lead to psychotic episodes and memory loss and all this other stuff. Now, see, what do you do? You get somebody that has worked in that and and uh, the memory starts to go and they start to have problems and they start doing weird things. What should we do as Christians? Comfort them. Be there to take care of them. The care of widows and things the Bible talks about. You know, um, I know it can get really challenging for people that are that are saved and that are out there. And, you know, and I realize the system is so far gone. You know, so many people have themselves in serious debt right now. They're having to work all kinds of hours. And you have husbands and wives that are working. And you have debt like crazy. And, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to get out all, of all that stuff and get back to the doing things a scriptural way. You have elderly people that are on social security. You shouldn't be on social security, but I realize there are people that are financially strapped that are on it. And it's just like, it's a real bad system. And you get yourself in years and years and years of wrong decisions. It can almost be impossible sometimes to come out of that. You know, I understand. Okay. I'm not condemning you because you're messed up in some areas like that. But my point is, the way that the Lord originally designed this thing to be, the body of Christ should be the ones taking care of the feeble-minded. Not putting them in special homes someplace where they can have special care. See? The Bible does talk about feeble-mindedness. And the Bible says that it's us as Christians that are supposed to be taking care of them. So, that's going to be it for this study. I've been wanting to put this thing together. And there's there's another aspect too, which I did not get into, and that is the thing of um, drug-induced mental illness, drug-induced devil possession. Uh, there's a lot of things out there. Uh, PCP, I talked about the thing of devil possession and the eyes. You know, some of these drugs will put you in touch with the spirit realm and the eyes will get really bulgy and big and they won't blink and take on kind of a serpentine type of a look to them. Uh, there is that as well. And, you know, you get bath salts, you know, and stuff like this. I mean, you can get mentally deranged from drugs as well. That's a whole other category. We're not even going to get into that. And that is in the psychiatry, you know, mental illness thing on Wikipedia there. There are definitely barbiturate type of things and, you know, drugs, uh, problems like that. I understand that too. Um, you know, and there's, there's, the study could be very, very big. But basically, it all boils down to this. You have psychiatry and you have the Bible. So let me switch hands here so that this is in my right hand. You know, Christ sits on the right hand of the throne there, you know. And this is in my left hand. You have these two different things. This one says that your problems are all biochemical uh, mental disorders that can be corrected with drugs or psychotherapy. This one here says... Your problems come from sin. Your problems are your fault, not your parents or your mommy and daddy didn't tell you they loved you enough or something like this, and that's why you can live in sin and go to hell when you die. No, 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 no. The Bible says we're all born as sinners. We all need to come to that point of repentance. We all need to acknowledge the fact that, yes, there is a God, and yes, we are accountable to Him. We are His creation. And so... The Bible gives you the formula for true mental wellness. This junk over here takes away from that and they tell you, oh no, you can reject God, you can reject the Bible and be mentally well as long as you take the drugs and whatever else so that you're sociable and whatever else. See, 
false science, oppositions of science falsely so called. And this will be used to persecute saved people after the body of Christ is left. And maybe even before. I can't say that. I don't know. I mean, there are people right now that think I'm mentally ill. <laughs> you know, within the lost world, I get that thing all the time. You're mentally ill. You need to seek treatment. You know, and I laugh about it. I think it's funny because I, I don't, I reject modern day psychiatry. It's a, like I said, it's a, it's a circus without a tent. It's, it's a bunch of, you know, nuttier than a pecan pie. I mean, these people are crazy. You know, three to four, you know, or two to three according to one, or maybe even four times more likely to kill themselves than somebody like me, you know. And hey, if you're living without God in the Bible, well, sure. You know, I can see why you'd be wanting to kill yourself. But the point is, this is the book that has the answers. And if you haven't figured that out yet, I pray you do soon. Because God's plans are coming to fruition every day. And it's increasing more and more. And there's going to come a point in time where the flight that leaves before God's wrath comes down the flight that leaves is going to be coming soon, departing soon. Jesus comes in the clouds. We go up to meet him. We get out. And then the wrath of God gets poured out and God's judgment gets poured out. And if you think that it's halfway through when the wrath starts, you've been deceived. When God opens the first seal, when the Lord Jesus Christ there opens the first seal in Revelation chapter 6 and unleashes the Antichrist, that basically starts the time of Jacob's trouble, the, the signing of the peace treaty there, back in the book of Daniel talks about that. That starts the time of Jacob's trouble. That time right there is going to be the worst time in history. And it's Jesus Christ that starts it. And it's obviously His judgment and His wrath. So it's not all the three and a half years, the first three and a half years are going to be peaceful. That's a lie. That isn't true. Now the first three and a half years isn't going to be as chaotic as the last three and a half years. I agree with that. But it's going to be a bad time. The Antichrist comes and brings war, for crying out loud. That's not a good time. You know? That's your chance to get out of this thing. Read and study the Bible. Acknowledge the fact that there is a God, that He created you. You are accountable to Him. You are a sinner. And you deserve to be judged. And your only way out is through Jesus Christ. You better do it. Time is running out.